Sing it better way in the water. Welcome to the Des Moines Church of Christ. 
Once again, I'm so glad that you've tuned in with us here this week. Today, we're going to be concluding the series that we've been focused on for the last six weeks on Paul's letter to the Philippians. I really hope it's been encouraging and helpful to you thus far. Let's start out by summarizing some of the circumstances that prompted this letter. We covered this in the first lesson, but since it's been a while, I just want to briefly review this. Paul started the church there about 50 AD. And at that time, when he was there in Philippi, he was thrown into prison and he was then asked, he was released and then asked to leave the city. So he left kind of abruptly there. And then about 10 or 12 years have gone by. Now it's about 60, 61 AD. And again, Paul's in prison because of his faith and preaching the word. But this time he's in prison in Rome. And while he's in prison there in Rome, he's gotten news, he's received news of some problems in the church in Philippi. There was some conflict in the church that was causing some division. There were some false teachers affecting the church. And then the Christians there were getting pretty anxious about the news that Paul's been thrown into prison again. So he writes this letter just to encourage them and to meet their needs, writes it from prison. And he's sending the letter with Epaphroditus. Epaphroditus was originally from Philippi, but then was there with Paul in Rome. And now he's sending Epaphroditus back to them to encourage them as well as to bring this letter to them. And more than anything else, the purpose of the letter is just to point the church to Christ. He uses the word Christ or Jesus or Christ Jesus or the Lord, some reference thereof more than 40 times in these four short chapters, 104 verses, I think it is, but he uses that word, those words, 40 different times. It's just amazing how much he really focused them on Jesus. Paul assured them that Christ would meet all their needs and calm all their anxieties. They just needed to embrace the truth that to live is Christ. So now let's read this final section of chapter 4, the conclusion to the whole letter. We're going to read uh, 4 verse 5 through verse 23. It's quite a chunk here, but let's read it together. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. Whatever you've learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, put it into practice, and the God of peace will be with you. I rejoice greatly in the Lord that at last you have renewed your concern for me. Indeed, you were concerned, but you had no opportunity to show it. I'm not saying this because I'm in need, for I have learned to be content whatever the circumstances. I know what it is to be in need, and I know what it is to have plenty. I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. I can do all this through him who gives me strength. Yet it was good of you to share in my troubles. Moreover, as you Philippians know, in the early days of your acquaintance with the gospel, when I set out from Macedonia, not one church shared with me in the matter of giving and receiving, except you only. For even when I was in Thessalonica, you sent me aid more than once when I was in need. Not that I desire your gifts, what I desire is that more be credited to your account. I have received full payment and have more than enough. I am amply supplied now that I've received from Epaphroditus the gifts you sent me. They're a fragrant offering, an acceptable sacrifice, pleasing to God. And my God will meet all your needs according to the riches of his glory in Christ Jesus. To our God and Father be glory forever and ever. Amen. Greet all God's people in Christ Jesus. The brothers and sisters who are with me send greetings. All God's people here send you greetings, especially those who belong to Caesar's household. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. 
Amen. Wow, that's really uh, uh, chock full of stuff, okay? Paul's really driving home in chapter 4 all the lessons he's been building for, building toward thus far. And he gets really personal at the end with some of some personal comments and so forth, as you saw. But what we want to do is kind of break this section down so we can understand what's going on. So much good stuff, but there's three main parts in this section. He talks about the peace of Christ, he talks about strength or peace in Christ, strength in Christ, and giving in Christ. Again, the whole emphasis is in Christ, but he hits those three areas, peace in Christ, strength in Christ, and giving in Christ. Now let's take a look at each of those sections and see what he says about them. First, the first one, verse 5 through 9, peace in Christ. This whole section is just all about peace. He says, don't be anxious about anything, but, but by prayer and petition with thanksgiving, present your requests and the God of peace will guard your hearts and minds and think about good things. He goes through all this good stuff, but the whole section is just all about how to have real peace. Talk about a relevant topic. Who doesn't want more peace right now, right? In today's crazy, stressed out, overly connected, rarely disconnected, rarely unplugged, always busy world, we all crave peace and we look everywhere to find it. We, we listen, look to music, you know, put on the headphones, just escape, you know, I'm in my own little world, finding peace, or watch movies just to, to escape, turn off all the lights and just watch a movie to live an, in another world for an hour and a half. We exercise just to blow off steam. We do hobbies just to, to energize ourselves with something we enjoy. We take trips, vacations, get outside in nature, sleep, that's always helpful. Uh, and, and unfortunately, sometimes we turn to sinful things like drugs and alcohol or even other sinful pleasures and vices. But there's only one source of peace that truly transcends all understanding. I love the way he describes that. He says the peace that, that passes understanding or transcends all understanding. A peace that's so good and so meaningful, you just can't even comprehend it or describe it. And that is the peace of God. And in this section, Paul outlines five ways to find that super peace, that peace of God. Each, sec each part, he just gives a practical that will help us to find that peace of God that transcends all understanding. And I'll highlight here the, those here in this verse, in this passage. Okay, first he says, the Lord is near. See that in the top line there? The Lord is near. Now it says the Lord is near. That near can mean one of two things. It can mean near in proximity, that the Lord is, is near you physically. I mean, he's right there with you. Or it can mean near in time. Like, he's coming, he's coming, he'll be there soon, which the Bible also talks about. So both of those are very biblical concepts. It, it probably references both. The Lord is near. When our girls were younger and living at home, sometimes Barry and I would go out on a date or have a meeting or something like that, and we'd be out late, and the girls would be home alone, and they'd hear a strange sound. Okay, usually it was Jana, you know, offense, Jana. Usually Jana would hear the strange sound. And then our dog, Angel, that was his name, would, would just start barking and barking and what's going on and barking. And then Jana would get even more afraid. And then Marin would get a little bit afraid. And Angel's getting more afraid and barking and everything. They'd all get freaked out. And then they'd give Barry a call, okay? And they'd call her up and they would love it whenever we would answer by saying, hey, we're close. We're almost home. There was just this immediate calm and peace that you could feel even through the phone when they heard that mom and dad are almost home. The Lord is near. It's the same concept, just knowing you're not alone. He's close. He's there. He's with you. That helps you find peace. The second thing he says here is he says, do not be anxious about anything. You see that in the second line? Do not be anxious about anything. What's interesting here is this is another command. Remember in Philippians, there's not many commands, but he commanded them to rejoice in the Lord three times. Here's another command. Do not be anxious about anything. It's kind of the opposite of rejoice in the Lord. He says rejoice in the Lord and do not be anxious about anything. He covers both ends of the spectrum there. 
So you think about it, what tempts you to be anxious the most? It's good to take some time and identify what those sources of anxiety are in your life. They're different for all of us, but we all have them. Then when you're in that situation or when those temptations to be worried or anxious come, you're aware, you're like, oh, here we go. These are the situations in which I get tempted to be anxious. Then you treat them as you would any other sinful temptation. You just say no. You just shut it down. You go shut down the anxiety. Yeah, you still may have to deal with the issue, deal with the problem, but you stop that irrational anxiety and panic and worry. You just don't go there. That's what Paul says. Just don't do it. Don't be anxious. And difficult as it may be, it's actually helpful to be called to just stop it. It means that you can. It reminds me, I had this good friend, okay, Lou Garcia. He's now an elder in the church in St. Louis. And many years ago, he had this job and he worked for like a credit card company or something where he would call up people who were delinquent on paying their credit card bills. And he'd be like, hey, you know, you need to pay this. And, you know, this is past the deadline. It was kind of a tough job to have, but he'd do that. Well, a lot of the people would respond with some real long story like, well, you know, my, my grandmother's in the hospital and I got laid off and, you know, I, I had this money, but it got stolen. And they'd go through this long thing and Lou would be listening. You know, he's a Christian. He's trying to understand. But then the boss of that office, he would also be in, in uh, listening periodically to the different calls. And when there was a call like that, he would just pick up the headset and he's listening and he would just interject over Lou. He'd just say, stop it. <laughs> and Lou would be like kind of embarrassed, but that's what he would say as they're complaining, as they're telling their sob story, stop it. And they would, and they would just kind of stop. And then he'd say, listen, you got to pay your bill. And it really worked. He just called them to stop it. Now that's kind of what Paul is saying here. Just don't be anxious about anything. Just stop it. Okay, kind of fun. Okay, and then uh, the third thing he references here is he says to pray. In every situation, by prayer and petition with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. It's really cool. He uses three different words in reference to prayer. He uses prayer, petition, and requests. He's really trying to drive it home. Pray, pray pray, and using three different colorful words to inspire them to do it. You know, he's saying bring all the tough issues in your life, all those sources of anxiety, all those things that steal your peace, bring them to God. Cast them on him because he cares for you. He's the only one who can truly take care of all of those issues. And it's really important to note that Paul specifies that those prayers were to be with thanksgiving. That's really important. You see how he says that? You, you present your request to God with thanksgiving. That's important because sometimes when we're presenting our request to God like that, we're just kind of going through all of our problems. And it's kind of like just, just listing problems and it makes us more conscious of all the problems. And even though we're praying, we're just going through this grocery list of problems and you can get more stressed out just thinking about all the problems and you miss the peace. But when you're thankful, when you're thinking about the good things you do have, when you're aware of all the great things happening in your life and the ways God is blessing you, and your prayer is just, it's, it's surrounded in thanksgiving, man, it brings about a totally different kind of peace. I appreciate Barry that she's doing this series of lessons for the women in their women's devotionals on gratitude. You can find those right here on our YouTube channel as well. Okay, so that's the third thing, pray. And then the fourth thing he says is, Think about good things. I love this. Whatever's true, whatever's noble, whatever's right, whatever's pure, whatever's lovely, whatever's admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. You remember that old adage, you are what you eat? Okay, that used to be popular when I was younger. You are what you eat. What you put into your body eventually becomes your body. It's true. Well, the same is true, and perhaps even more so, with your thoughts, your inner thoughts. Whatever you think about the most really does affect you and ultimately define you as a person. The compilation of all those thoughts going through your mind and your heart, they either nourish you or they poison you. 
They either build you up or they tear you down physically, emotionally, relationally, and spiritually. Just Google, just Google effects of anxiety versus happiness. I mean, you're going to see the physical effects of each of those. You're going to see the relational effects, the emotional effects. And of course, the Bible is full of the spiritual effects. So think about it. What types of thoughts race through your heart and mind the most? Is it worries, stresses, hurts, guilt, fear, conflicts, shortcomings, failures, worldly passions, or is it true things, noble things, right things, pure things, lovely things, excellent things, admirable things, like Paul talks about here. Your answer to that question, whatever you think about the most, will largely affect the kind of person you become. This is so important in our world right now because we all know there are so many crazy, unsettling, stressful things happening in the world all around us. Global pandemic, racial inequalities and tensions, massive wildfires, wild storms, an upcoming election, and now an open seat in the Supreme Court, and this in the midst of the most active mainstream media and social media ever in history. Now, all that craziness, it's just fanned into flame by all of that. We're surrounded by extreme views on every side, everywhere we turn. And that's on top of the normal stresses and pressures of life that are enough that we have to deal with on a regular basis. All this works together to produce the exact opposite of peace in our lives. Stress, tension, anxiety, cynicism, depression. I don't know if you've read some of the, the reports of the emotional health of what's going on in, in America and all over the world. It's these kind of problems that are coming out because all of that just surrounds us. It's inescapable. It's everywhere. We can't turn away from it. And it produces the opposite of peace. But Paul says you can help overcome that by making the conscious, deliberate, repeated choice to focus on the things that promote peace, to think about the good things, and to put good thoughts into your heart and your mind, rather than all those negative thoughts. For me, it's things like reading the Bible. Something as simple as just going every day, I want to read the Bible, to get the good of God's Word into your heart and mind. Memorizing a verse, just finding a verse that you really like, memorizing it, so you can think about it throughout the day. Even like radio station, listening to Christian radio, I started doing that a while back, and it really helped me find a lot more peace, all right? Some of the songs are kind of corny and cheesy, but man, it's a lot better than some of the other stressful stuff that's on the radio. Or maybe it's just your music playlist. Just putting Christian music in there can really help fill you with good thoughts like that. Or just when you're around friends, just sharing good news encouraging them with good things that are happening or asking them, hey, what good things are happening in your life? Making a list of the things you're most thankful for and spending extra time in prayer, just being thankful for the good things that you have. All those little choices add up to make a big difference and help you to focus on the good things and lead to greater peace. And then he shares the fifth step to finding that super peace in the next sentence. He appeals to the church to basically follow his leadership. Whatever you've learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, put it into practice and the God of peace will be with you. He says basically follow his leadership and teaching. Earlier, he'd called the church to follow the pattern that he'd set for them. And now he reiterates that again. Follow my example as I followed the example of Christ is basically what he's saying. Likewise, we too need good role models like Paul. We need heroes in the faith to trust and to follow the example of when the going gets tough, when we're not sure what to do, you go, man, look at their life. Look at this person. Man, they've just set a good example. Let me just follow that pattern and do what they've taught me to do. Paul says that if you do that, if you follow what he's taught, the God of peace will be with you. 
That's kind of cool, because earlier in the passage, he references the peace of God. Here he mentions the God of peace. It's kind of cool. The peace of God, the God of peace. The peace of God comes from the God of peace. You know, there are a lot of things in our lives that we can't control, but we can absolutely control whether we find the peace of God or not. There are a lot of things we can't control. But we can control whether we find the peace of God or not. If you regularly devote yourself to these five practical steps in these verses, you really find that peace of God in the midst of all these crazy storms of life. And that peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds. And that's much better than any drug or hobby or escape can provide. The next topic he addresses ties right in with this as well. In uh, chapter 4, verse 10 through 13, he talks about strength in Christ. And here, uh, I'll just read this real briefly. I, re I, greatly re I rejoice greatly in the Lord that at last you renewed your concern for me. Indeed, you were concerned, but had no opportunity to show it. I'm not saying this because I'm in need, for I've learned to be content whatever the circumstances. I know what it is to be in need and I know what it is to have plenty. I've learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. I can do all this through him who gives me strength." And Paul certainly did indeed know what it meant to be in need. And he's saying that, listen, I know what it is to be facing tough times. To, to, to show us an example of that, in 2 Corinthians, he recounts just some of the trials and challenges, some of the times he was in need like this. And it's interesting to note that when he writes about those in 2 Corinthians, that's about six years before he's writing this letter. That's only about halfway through his ministry. So, so many more trials and challenges happen after he wrote this in 2 Corinthians. But I'm going to put up this passage and read it. 2 Corinthians 11, verse 23. Oops, I'm backed up here. 2 Corinthians, uh, 2 Corinthians 11, verse 23. I have worked much harder, been imprisoned more frequently, been flogged more severely, and been exposed to death again and again. Five times I received from the Jews the forty lashes minus one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was pelted with stones. Three times I was shipwrecked. I spent a night and a day in the open sea. I've been constantly on the move. I've been in danger from rivers, in danger from bandits, in danger from my fellow Jews, in danger from Gentiles, in danger in the city, in danger in the country, in danger at sea, and in danger from false brothers. I've labored and toiled and have often gone without sleep. I've known hunger and thirst and have often gone without food. I've been cold and naked, and besides everything else, I face daily the pressure of my concern for all the churches. Who is weak and I don't feel weak? Who's led into sin? and I do not inwardly burn. Man, Paul understood what challenges were like. He understood what it was to be in need. And yet he says, back in this passage that we're looking at here, he says, I've learned the secret of being content in all of these situations. And it's cool in Greek, we can't really get it in English, but in Greek he uses like this mystical language here, these mystical words. He says, like literally, if we were to translate it, I have been initiated with the secret. Like, I've received this special secret. I've gone through this initiation and received this secret of how I can be content in the worst of situations. And then he says, here's what it is. I can do all this through him who gives me strength, through Christ who gives me strength. That's really cool. Now, over the years, many people, including myself, have taken this passage a little bit out of context when it's translated, I can do all things through him who gives me strength. And we use that as an inspirational kind of a verse. And yeah, it's kind of true, but, but it's also not really true. It's taken out of context. Like you could say, okay, can I lift a thousand pounds? I can do all things through him who gives me strength. Well, let me see it, okay? It's not really going to work because that's not what the passage is really saying here. But what the passage is saying is, I can do all this through him who gives me strength. He's saying, I, I can endure all these challenges, the worst of trials, the most incredible sufferings be in all these needs, and yet be completely content during all of that. Because I have the secret. I've learned the secret. I can do it through Christ 
who gives me strength. Literally in Greek it says, I can do all this through Christ, my strengthener. I like that. That's the secret. Christ is my strengthener. It's kind of cool to think about that. Paul had a strengthener in Christ that gave him the strength to endure the most incredible difficulties life had to offer. Well, you too, all of us as Christians, have a strengthener in Christ. You have a personal strengthener. You know, some people talk about having a personal trainer or something. This is way better. You just cut right to the strength. You have a personal strengthener. One of, his, one of Christ's superpowers is to give you the strength you need to be completely content no matter what is happening in your life. Man, that's a great superpower to have. You ever feel weak? Overwhelmed? Like you just can't go on anymore? Needy? Remember, you have a strength.